Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master, as the name suggests, is a Z690 motherboard that supports Intel 12th Gen Alder Lake. So that's the new Core i9-12900K, which is installed in the board right now. Also, it supports DDR5 memory. I'll be installing this Corsair Vengeance DDR5 momentarily. It's relatively expensive, £445 here in the UK. It's towards the upper end of the Gigabyte range, but it's not quite at the extreme end of the scale. However, the spec is very high end. The layout of the board is interesting. If we start at the top, we've got a pair of 8-pin EPS connectors. These are high-end solid pinned connectors. You don't need two 8 pins to run the Core i9 past, say, 400 watts. One of them will do the job nicely. The fact you got two, it's overkill. It looks good, but unless you're into LN2, you simply don't need that amount of power. You'll see we have a single PCI Express Time 16 graphics slot. It's Gen 5 because that's the latest standard supported by Intel. We don't have any Gen 5 cards yet. You might expect to see a pair of graphics slots. You don't have that. You've got the one times five running directly off the processor. At the foot of the board, you have a pair of Gen 3 slots, each running at times four. So they're supporting a sound card or a network card, something like that. This is essentially a single slot board. Under this hefty great big heatsink here, we've got five M.2 slots. One is connected directly to the processor, two are connected to the chipset, the two at the bottom, there's a bit of lane sharing going on. So if you want to populate those two slots, you're not going to be able to use all six of the laid down SATA connectors. Realistically, that's not a problem. If you look at the top of the board, you'll see plenty of fan connectors, two over by the EPS connectors and four at the top of the memory slots where we also have the power button and the postcode debug. Moving down the side of the board, we've got the 24 pin connector, a pair of USB 3.1s, a USB type C, and various headers for things like temperature sensors. As you go across the foot of the board, you'll see we have the front panel headers. We've got more fan connectors. The reset button is down here. And we've also got USB 2. In terms of the layout of the board, it's clean and tidy. It might not be immediately obvious to you, it's actually E80X. It's quite a narrow E80X, but there is a lot of hardware packed in here. Turning to the rear I.O. panel, we've got a Q flash button so you can update the BIOS without having a processor, memory or graphics card installed. And we have a clear CMOS button. We've got the antenna points for the Wi-Fi 6E, so it's triple band, 2.456 gigahertz. We've got loads of USB 3.1 and 3.2. We've got a single display port, which is a bit odd, we'll come to that. We have one Ethernet, that's 10 gigabit Ethernet. We've got two type C's, but they are not identical. One is 3.2 Gen 2, the other is Gen 2 by 2, so double the bandwidth. And then we've got full audio support. The heat sinks on the M.2s preclude you from using SSDs that already have a heat sink such as this PNY Accelerate. If you want to use a specific drive like that, you'll need to use it in the primary slot because you can remove this one heat sink and install the SSD. What lies beneath these enormous heat sinks on the VRMs? It's worth pointing out the main heat sink under this uh, piece of shrouding which has some lighting going on in the Gigabyte Aorus logo. It's worth pointing out that 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 heatsink is very large. It looks like it's been made that large so it extends to cover both the VRMs and also the Aquantia 10 gigabit Ethernet chip because those things use a few watts of power and they require cooling. You can see the finned coolers have a large amount of surface area and that the fins themselves, they have ventilation that uh, allows air to pass through them. It would appear that a great deal of work has gone into those heat sinks. You do, however, have to wonder about the fact that the main heatsink is covered by that shielding on the I.O. panel. Moving on to the VRMs themselves, we have a 19 plus 1 plus 2 arrangement. The VRM controller uses a 20 phase Renesas 229131 chip. The main event is 19 phases of 105 amps from Renesas. These are smart power stages and we have a single 90 amp phase from ISL powering the IGP. When I mentioned I had my doubts about 
a display port on the rear I.O. Generally speaking, I prefer display port to HDMI. The thing is, I don't think anybody's gonna be using this board using IGP. The only function for that connector is for fault finding. Your graphics card appears to have a problem, something's gone wrong, you need to plug directly into the processor and use the IGP. Clearly it doesn't apply to the F SKU of processors. If you're doing that, you may well find your system still doesn't behave. We're seeing reports that HDMI is the get out of jail connector. Display port can be a bit peculiar. Sometimes you have to boot off HDMI before you can then switch to display port. If I was gonna pick one connector for the rear IO panel for graphics, I would use HDMI rather than DisplayPort. In that sense, I think that might be a bit of a mistake by Gigabyte. Returning to the VRMs, the other two phases for the VCC in are from monolithic power systems. So we have a two phase controller and two 70 amp power stages. So in total, we have 22 power stages, two for the VCC in, one for the IGP, 19 for the CPU. You've got something like two kilowatts of power for the CPU. You're never gonna use anything like that. Clearly, this system would melt were you to pump two kilowatts through it. So we're running at something like 20% of the maximum potential of the VRMs. It looks very impressive. Clearly, it's gonna run as cool as ice. Uh, but when all said and done, this is to make Gigabyte look good on paper. It's so they can say, look, we've got 19 power stages for your CPU, which is more than 16 or 14 or 12. Also worth pointing out, the master has an eight layer PCB. Other members of the Z690 family from Gigabyte use six layers. The master is the lowest of a handful of boards that offer you eight layers, and that helps them to dissipate heat from the system. Our test system consists of an Intel Core i9-12900K, Sabrent Rocket 4.0 SSD, Corsair Vengeance DDR5 memory. The power supply, Seasonic Prime Titanium 850 watt, and the graphics card from Pallet Gaming Pro RTX 3080. And the CPU cooler is a Corsair H150i Elite LCD, so that's a 360mm AIO. Here we are in the BIOS, and as you can see, we're in easy mode. And the irony is that this high-end motherboard doesn't need all the features on offer. So SATA, no device found. True. PCI Express. Well, yes, you've got a graphics card. M.2. Well, yes, you've got an SSD. Uh, I've connected the fans from the all-in-one directly to the motherboard, so it's reporting the fans spinning away. The CPU fan is actually the pump, and then the three sys fans are the three fans on the RAD. XMP is enabled, and the boot manager is booting off the single SSD. Could hardly get more straightforward. Let's go into advanced mode. Everything is on auto. The whole damn lot. Now, CPU upgrade. I wondered about this feature. And it turns out you can go into either gaming profile or maximum performance profile. Max performance profile, adjust the turbo ratio, plus one. I mean, that's max performance? Gaming profile. Disables all e cores. I mean, a reasonable thing to do, but not quite as exciting as you might hope. XMP, well, it works, so why mess around with manual settings? We don't need to do any manual settings. Advanced voltage settings. Everything on auto, CPU VRM settings. Here we go, right, load line calibration. What options do we have? All I mean, ultra extreme, good lord. Let's put it on auto and we'll see what happens. Oh, here we go. Here's something that might be of interest. App center download. This is the, as soon as the PC fires up, it wants to download the Gigabyte App Center and a whole bunch of software thing. You might choose to disable that. It's the equivalent of a Zeus Armory crate. And we can ignore all that. Sysinfo, well, obvious. And then boot. I mean, 
it's actually amazingly simple. I think we can exit that saving because we haven't made any changes. Yep, you see, load line calibration, auto to auto. So I've tinkered, but I've changed nothing. We've done a good deal of benchmarking with the Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master, played some games, run Cinebench, used Blender, Handbrake, Ada64, and a number of other tests. Of course, we have to distinguish between how the Core i9-12900K runs in general against how it runs on this specific motherboard against the other motherboard that I've previously tested, which was the MSI Meg Unify. The figures on the charts for the Meg Unify are now relatively elderly, although you can see they're very similar to the Gigabyte figures. I am gonna review the Meg Unify in the near future, so I'll be retesting it just to see how much those figures have changed. The Gigabyte has tightened up voltages slightly over the MSI, is using less power to produce, frankly, the same performance. That's the key takeaway here. But having said that, let's dive into the benchmarks and see what we've got. In Cinebench R23 Multicore, the Core i9-12900K is right up the top of the chart, while the Gigabyte performs slightly better than the MSI on Auto. When you overclock, the MSI pulls ahead by the tiniest of margins. In the grand scheme of things, there's nothing to choose. Single core performance in Cinebench R23, it's a similar story. Good performance, doesn't matter which of the two motherboards you choose. Bapco Crossmark. The Gigabyte is up the top of the charts. Slightly bizarrely, the auto processor settings beat the overclocked settings. And you can see the difference in the two scores, absolutely negligible. So essentially overclocking in Bapco makes no difference. Handbrake H.264 conversion. We see here a reasonable jump in performance over the earlier testing with the Meg Unify. I'll be interested to see how the Meg Unify performs when I retest. I suspect this is down to Windows 11 rather than the difference in the platforms. In the Handbrake H.265 conversion, again, very little to choose between the two motherboards, but it is clear that the MSI somehow sneaks a small advantage. 3D Mark times by CPU score. Gigabyte beats MSI. However, we all know that FutureMark updates their software all the time. When I retest the MSI, we'll see whether this is truly an advantage for Gigabyte or whether it's actually down to the software. And then we move on to games. Far Cry 6, Gigabyte at the top of the charts at 1080p and also at 1440p. Far Cry New Dawn, it's close. The MSI beats Gigabyte, but the scores are very similar. However, the gaming performance, both at 1080 and at 1440, is excellent. Watch Dogs Legion, at 1080, Gigabyte tops the charts. At 1440, it's the AMDs that take over. Out of Intel, however, Gigabyte once again beats the MSI. Ada64 memory bandwidth. We're only looking here at Intel 12th gen because of course DDR5 versus DDR4. As you can see, the numbers are huge. There is nothing to choose between the MSI Mega Unify and the Gigabyte Aorus Master. Power consumption. This is where things get interesting. Gigabyte is using significantly less power than MSI. This is system power at the wall socket. We're talking 50 watts on auto, 35 watts overclocked. However, as I say, when I retest the MSIs, there's bound to be some BIOS updates. I'll be fascinated to see what difference the latest test results are from the MSI. CPU temperature. On auto, Gigabyte has the advantage over the MSI, but you've just seen the Gigabyte's using less power, so it makes perfect sense that it runs cooler by a five degrees Celsius. That's well worth having. Again, I'll be retesting the MSI. Fascinated to see how those figures change. When you overclock the Core i9, you get very little extra performance because the thing's delivered close to its thermal limits, and now it's running at 100 Celsius on both the Gigabyte and the MSI motherboards. And then we come to the VRMs. When you pound the Core i9 in this system, uh, on auto, it's pulling 207 watts. When you overclock it, the CPU is pulling 290 watts. But are those VRMs being hurt by the shroud? Only way to tell is to do some back-to-back -back testing. 
It's not difficult removing the shroud from the VRM heatsink on the rear I.O. However, it is slightly fiddly. You have to remove the back plate from the rear of the motherboard. That's about eight screws. Thermal pads on the back of the VRMs and also on the 10 gig ethernet. You also need to remove the heatsink from the M.2 slots because it covers at least one of the screws. And then a few more screws later, you can remove the rear I.O. shield. Got a total of 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 20 fasteners uh, in order to remove the shroud. Also worth pointing out that the shroud includes a thread which secures this end of the primary M.2 heatsink. So you've got a gap just there. Removing the shroud is certainly doable just for this little experiment, but it's not something you do in day-to-day -day use. That I am quite sure about. On with the testing. After 10 minutes the Cinebench R23 with the shroud removed, the VRM temperatures actually increased by 2 degrees Celsius. I did not expect that. Also, I'm not at all sure I prefer the industrial look of the board with the shroud removed. So, my expectations and my preconceptions dashed. Onward with the review. So, amazingly the answer is, on auto, the VRMs are running at 57 Celsius. Remove the shroud, the temperature is 59 Celsius. When you overclock, the VRMs run at 61 Celsius. Remove the shroud, 63 Celsius. The range therefore very tight, 57 to 63. So the VRM temperatures on this open test bench, icy cold, significantly cooler than the CPU. They are no problem whatsoever. You've seen the quality of the hardware used by Gigabyte. This does not come as a surprise to you, I'm quite sure. The VRMs in this motherboard are next level. Let's wrap up with my pros and cons about the Gigabyte Z690 Aorus Master. Pros, the good points. Those VRMs are epic and the heat sinks on them are really good pieces of work. I like the clean design with the single PCI Express Gen 5 graphics slot and the pair of Gen 3 expansion slots further down the board. On the other hand, I'm sure there'll be plenty of people that don't like that setup, in which case this board's not for you. You've got superb support for M.2, USB, Wi-Fi 6E and Bluetooth latest specs. And finally, a huge number of PWM fan headers and they are distributed liberally around the board in good locations. Cons, the negatives. These might sound quite minor to you. They kind of are, but they got to me. First, there are two type C's on the rear IO panel. They are not the same spec as each other. They look identical. That's annoying. It has single 10 gigabit ethernet, and I think there should be a secondary connector. After all that, 10 gig would be great for connecting to a NAS or transferring video files, in which case you need a connection to connect to the internet. A 2.5 gig Intel would do nicely. And finally, we have DisplayPort on the rear I.O. I think it should be HDMI. That's it. Relatively minor points. I think it's a solid 8.5 out of 10, and I think it's worth buying.